So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the praetorium, and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you, and power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me, unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover, and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of Ascal, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side, and Jesus in the centre. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to each a soldier apart, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said therefore among themselves, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, 
and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again another scripture says, They shall look on him whom they pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who was at first who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and, alo and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bowed, bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. John chapter 19 is the passage which crucifixion of Jesus takes place. Let's pick up from verse 31. Uh, there, is, there is the immediate follow-up. The Sabbath is coming. The time is short. People don't want bodies to hang, hanging around on the cross. They want to make sure that people aren't hanging on the cross during the high day of Sabbath, especially uh, the Passover Sabbath, um, as it was. Uh, the soldiers come and then they make sure they break the legs of the people so that people die quicker. First person's leg is broken and then the second person's leg is broken who was being crucified and they come to Jesus and they saw Jesus was already dead, therefore they did not break his leg. The reason they want to break the legs, if you think kind of practical sense, when you are hanging on the cross, the only way you can breathe is to push up with your legs to press down against the nail that is holding your feet to the cross, to press down against that in order to lift your body, to take the pressure of the lungs and allow you to take a breath. It is actually very awful, very, very horrible and awful. If they break your legs, then your death would be speed up because you could not breathe in. It is like really, really, really horrible. It is really horrible. But what we see is they did not break legs of Jesus because he was already dead. And it states that they did not break his legs. And we are told this is to fulfill the scripture that none of, none of his bones will be broken. That was the first checkup. Second checkup is they put the spare on his side and what they see is blood and something look like water comes out. That's the proof that he's again dead, um, that the fluid around his heart had already separated. Again, he's dead. But I, I don't want to focus on those medical realities as awful as it is. I want to bring our attention to verse 35. John says in verse 35, he who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true and he knows that he's telling the truth, the truth that you may believe, you may also believe. Notice the reputation. The reputation in that he's kind of underlying that the whole thing, the breaking of the legs, which they didn't break his legs because he was, it was very, obvious that he was dead. They pierced on his side to prove that he was dead and that showed he was definitely dead. It is like very brutal and very nasty. It was very very much standard thing that people needed to do their job and their job was to make sure this person is dead and now they are checking it out to make sure the person is dead and that has been proven. John wants to underline for us. He wants to make it clear that, look, I, born with, I have borne witness. I have seen it with my own eyes. I was right there. The tes this testimony, the testimony is true. It is clear that I am telling you the truth. I know I am telling you the truth. Why does he underline it? So that you also may believe. This is the truth. I am underlying, I am expressing it so that you also may believe. Sometimes we think 
crucifixion is just any other thing in Christian doctrine or in Christian life. Because you hear that every day, every Sunday in the church, in Bible studies, you get to see the pictures in the stained glasses. You get to see pictures in the children's storybook. But in the reality, it was brutal and John wants us to know that it was brutal. John wants us to believe in that. It was brutal, yet John wants us to trust it. It was brutal. John wants us to be certain of it. That Jesus died on the cross by crucifixion. It is historical fact alongside. They've got eyewitnesses. Gives us the description. Professionals checks it out. And then they tell us he was dead. Jesus died on the cross by crucifixion. It's not only just an event, but he died on the cross for you and for me. He died on the cross for us. And he wants us, he wants you, and he wants me to place all of our trust on him. 